Okay, I think we'll, we'll get started. Our, our next speaker is a true microbe hunter. She actually has discovered two of the viruses that we've talked about today, the one that we just heard about, Kaposi sarcoma virus, and uh, the newest of the human cancer viruses, the Merkel cell uh, polyoma virus. It's Yuan Chang, who's from the University of Pittsburgh. She's going to tell us about identification and characterization of the newest polyoma virus. Yuan. Thank you very much. Um, specifically, I'd like to thank Arnie and uh, Bob for and the rest of the sponsors for inviting me to uh, this talk. And I would like to thank the audience that's here for allowing me to encroach it on your postprandial lethargy. Um, what I'd like to do today is just to give you the story um, of the identification of the Merkel cell polyoma virus, um, some initial characterization. It's really early days yet in terms of the research on this virus, but I hope that you'll take away with it a feeling that um, this is indeed a new human tumor uh, virus, and it's associated with the human cancer, Merkel cell carcinoma. So to start off with, I'd like to go broadly and explain to you the hows and whys that um, led to the discovery of, of this virus. And so, as Arnie alluded to earlier on this morning, um, over 20% of uh, cancer burden worldwide is attributable to infectious agents. And one way to classify these agents, which we have found very useful in our lab, is to divide them up as to whether these agents um, uh, have an indirect or a direct mechanism for causing the tumors that they're associated with. And so agents that act by indirect carcinogenesis, um, real, oops, where did it go? Okay. Where's the pointer? Okay. Um, are, are those agents that actually act outside of the cell? And um, the tumors that they're associated with are usually arise in a milieu of persistent, uh, prolonged inflammation. And these diseases or cancers are um, usually associated with a prolonged incubation period. Now, in contrast, the direct carcinogens are thought to act intracellularly from within the cell. And so these organisms are typified by the viruses, some of which are listed here, and they bring in exogenous material, genetic material, that mediates the carcinogenesis uh, in the tumors that they're associated with. And so our lab has had a very long-standing interest in hunting for viruses, and specifically viruses that act as direct carcinogens, because we reason that in such a model, those organisms would be found at at least one copy in every tumor cell. And we also reason that these tumors would be easily or more easily identifiable because they would tend to be under immunologic control, and so in hosts or patients who are immunocompromised, they would tend to express themselves clinically at a more higher frequency. Um, so this is just um, a list of the known human tumor viruses. And um, if you look at the diseases that they're associated with, they comprise a, a very significant public health problem. Um, granted, uh, most, most severe in third world countries, but um, clearly uh, major health problems. And so um, we, um, you know, we've heard many times that in order to be a cancer researcher, you really have to be an optimist because it's so hard to, you know, uh, deal with, with, with this issue. But I think that with tumor virology, we, we have a reason to be optimistic because here are foreign agents that actually elaborate foreign antigens, foreign proteins, that then we can develop medicines, vaccines, and diagnostic tests to, to help us. So despite what is said in the popular literature about how research on cancer is flatlined, I think that tumor virology is a very, very interesting um, field where I think the research can translate into actual benefits for the patient. So to look for a new virus, um, in, in terms of a background, I think that it's, it's pretty true that most, well, almost all new pathogen discovery throughout history has really worked in lockstep with the development of new technologies. 
And uh, Robin Weiss has really elegantly and elabor elaborated on you know, this association between advances in technology and the ability to detect new pathogens. And this comes from you know, the uh, inception of uh, the microscope to the ability to grind better lenses to look at even smaller organisms to Koch's work on um, define, having defined culture media so that one can isolate and clone organisms. Um, DNA recombinant uh, technology, DNA hybridization, all of these technologies have, for the most part, resulted in advances in microbiology and the detection of new, new organisms. And so what we took advantage of in our lab is to think about the new technologies that have occurred in the last several years that can allow us to uh, look at this question of looking for a new, new, new pathogen. And so there's a lot of a lot of advances made in uh, DNA high throughput sequencing, and and recently the entire genome of the, um, the of humans have been sequenced. And so, with these technologic advances, we developed a methodology in our lab, which we call digital transcriptome subtraction, or DTS. It's very easy, very simple-minded. What we do is we construct um, um, and sequence cDNA libraries. Um, out of these cDNA libraries uh, we, that are sequenced, we developed a high fidelity data set, so a, a comparable thing to the FRED score. We call it a Lucy score. We make sure that these sequences that we're working with have high fidelity. Then we compare this data set, and I, I use the ro royal we here, but we have a very talented postdoctoral scientist in our lab named Hui Chen Feng who developed this technique and wrote the computer scripts to allow us to do this, and uh, really an amazing person. But when we compare um, these hi-fi uh, fidelity sets and run it through the human databases, um, we come up with what we call non-human candidates, which then we can take on to experimental sequence extension or to compare with viral databases. And finally, we come out with what we hope are candidates for new pathogens. To um, see if this actually works, we performed first a pilot study. And what we used here, and we really stacked the, the, the deck in our favor here. So we took a KSHV infected cell line. So Don mentioned earlier on that it's very hard to infect and establish a cell line. But KSHV is also associated with a monoclonal um, tumor, uh, lymphoma in humans called primary fusion lymphomas. And from these primary fusion lymphomas, we can derive cell lines that are stably infected with virus. And in this case of this cell line that was derived from Don's lab, the BCBL1 cell line, it's positive for the viral genome um, at 50 copies of virus per cell. So we've got lots of virus here. We know the sequence, the entire sequence of this virus. And so we subjected this to DTS. Um, and we did actually a very shallow, excuse me, a very shallow uh, sequencing uh, with only um, 9,000 transcripts sequenced. And taking it through the DTS pro process, we subtracted out everything but three transcripts. And these three transcripts were comprised of two transcript types from KSHV T1.1 and K12, and then a third tag that um, was actually a human EST that hadn't been previously annotated. So using this technique, um, we were able to perform this pilot study and show that KSHV transcript comprised 0.2 percent of the BCBL1 transcriptome, um, or 200 transcript copies per million transcripts of BCBL transcriptome. And so having this in hand, um, what we decided to do was then take it for a test drive. And we had a couple of candidate uh, diseases that we had been thinking about for a while in the laboratory, and I'll just tell you about the success. <laughs> so um, we uh, wanted to look at Merkel cell carcinoma. Um, and the reason is because we were very intrigued by the clinical and the epidemiologic presentation of this tumor. So Merkel cell carcinoma is very rare. It's a, it's a very rare skin cancer, but it is very aggressive, and patients have a very poor prognosis. The interesting thing about this cancer is that it seems to occur more frequently than expected 
in immunocompromised individuals. And so in transplant patients and AIDS patients, we see an increase in this tumor more so than one would expect. And uh, this was actually um, really well documented by Eric Engels in this publication in Lancet, which came out in 2002. So Merkel cell carcinoma, um, why is it called Merkel cell carcinoma? Well, it's derived from a cell, the Merkel cell, um, that is located in the deep um, epidermis. And so here they are represented by the circle. And as you can see, there are these branches. Um, and what that represents is the afferent sensory nerve that sends out neurites, which contact the Merkel cell and forms a cell disk um, that comprises the mechanoreceptors that are present in our skin. And so what do we mean by this? So this structure, uh, the Merkel cell neuritic complex, allows us to feel pressure, allows us to, um, for example, in our fingertips, um, differentiate really fine uh, structures. This is what allows us to, to read Braille, for example. And so Merkel cell carcinomas are thought to derive from these Merkel cells. And by immunohistochemistry, when one takes a biopsy and looks at this tumor under the microscope, cut sections and stain it by H&E, what you see is a monomorphous population of small, round, blue cells. And this is actually a catchphrase that's used um, by pathologists, these small, round, blue cell tumors. Um, there are many uh, entities that can have this appearance, and frequently these these create a diagnostic dilemma for the pathologist. And so what one does is to apply a battery of immunostains to look at the immunophenotype of these, uh, of these lesions. So you could either have you know, a, a, a metastatic lymphoma, a small cell neuroendocrine um, metastasis from the lung, could be amelanotic melanoma, it could be Ewing sarcoma. But the interesting thing about Merkel cells is that it shows both neuroendocrine as well as epithelial differentiation. So these tumors will variably express neuroendocrine markers such as synaptophysin, um, neuron-specific enolase, chromogranin, but they will invariably express a cytokeratin marker called CK20, and this is a low molecular 20 kilodalton um, cytokeratin um, isoform. And, um, the appearance is, is really unusual in that uh, the cytokeratin-20 stains in a almost pathognomonic perinuclear dot-like pattern or a crescentic pattern. So pathologists use it all the time to differentiate this small cell blue cell tumor from all other types of small blue cell tumors. Um, so we were finally able to collect enough cases of this. And we performed DTS analysis um, of four of them. And how this was done was we took one of the tumors, MC, mm, excuse me, one of the tumors, MC347, and made a library out of that. And then another library made out of three um, of the tumors. And so in total, what we sequenced was approximately 400,000 um, uh, transcripts, churned it through DTS, and and came out with uh, 2,000 candidates, uh, DTS candidates, which then we blasted um, um, against uh, viral genome. And so what we found is that one of these transcripts, it was a 211 nucleotide cDNA with, um, we found that it had 54% identity to African green monkey polyomavirus T antigen. So this was a eureka moment in our lab, I must tell you. And <laughs> once we had pulled ourselves down from the ceiling, what we did was uh, we uh, used PCR to extend the genome and uh, go around. And um, this first genome that was deposited um, is our prototype, uh, which um, is a genome that is the size of all other polyomaviruses. This genome was 5,387 base pairs. And it had a genome structure similar to other polyomaviruses. There is a, a replication origin off of which there's it by the genome bidirectionally encodes for an early region that includes uh, the T antigen isoforms, as well as uh, a late region that uh, encodes for the viral proteins, which we call VP1, VP2, and VP3, and they're analogous to um, the papillomavirus L1 and L2. So um, 
An interesting fact is that after we um, obtained the entire genome, we went back to our DTS candidates. And there is a region here in exon 2 of the T antigen um, that is poorly conserved among all the polyome, uh, um, in comparison to the other polyomaviruses, is actually an extended insertion of uh, sequences that we were not able to match previously, but having the genome, we were able to match. So we found two DTS, can or DTS um, transcripts that belong to Merkel cell polyomavirus. And so since the T antigen has been such an important model and has, um, in, in terms of for many fields of biology as well as for um, tumor virology, we concentrated on the T antigen initially. And this is a mapping that we performed where we uh, did three, three prime, five prime race as well as northern blot um, hybridization. And we were able to identify, um, hmm, four transcripts. Uh, one, uh, we, and, and it has, these, these uh, different transcripts have, have corresponding um, forms in SV40 large T. And so um, we use the nomenclature of, of uh, SV40. And so we found one transcript that corresponds to uh, the large T with uh, one intron here and a splice site two transcripts that corresponds to the small t and a, um, a multiply splice transcript that uh, in SV40 is called 17KT, but because of our insertion, we have a larger protein and it actually runs at about 57KT. And so hereafter, I'm going to be referring to it as the 57KT. So it has structure splicing patterns similar to SV40 large T. And when one looks at the uh, motifs, the protein motifs of uh, the sequence, we can see that we have very well conserved protein domains. So we have uh, in the N terminus a CR1 domain, a DNA J domain, PP2A binding domain, RB binding domain, the LXCXE domain. And then in the C terminus, we have the origin binding domain and um, a helicase domain. So very much like, um, like the other polyomavirus T antigens. Now, with the sequence of the genome in hand, we were able to uh, perform phylogenetic studies and classification of this uh, new uh, polyomavirus. The polyomaviruses as a group are subdivided into three, um, the SV40 subgroup, avian subgroup, and the murine subgroup, and all the human um, to uh, polyomaviruses that have been previously described, all are similar to SV40 and um, cluster with the SV40 group. So we have BK, which causes nephropathy, interstitial nephropathy in patients who are transplant, uh, who are post-transplant. We have JC virus that occurs in AIDS patients and in severely immunosuppressed patients where JC virus will reactivate in glial cells, oligodendroglial cells in the brain and cause a disease called PML, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. Um, KI and WU were described um, or identified and identified um, uh, about a year ago, and they're named after the institutions in which they were isolated, um, KI for the Karolinska and WU for Wash Washington University. Now, these two polyomaviruses were um, identified out of respiratory secretions, and up until now, they are, have not been associated with a clinical syndrome or a disease in humans. Um, but again, it's early days yet for those viruses as well. Now, if you'll notice, MCV does not cluster in the SV40 group, but rather it is in the murine group. And I want to caution, uh, make a cautionary note here that, um, that this does not mean that this is due to transmission from mice into the human population. Um, it is actually most closely related to the African green monkey lymphotropic virus, which was identified in the 1970s um, by Harold Zurhausen. So um, this actually is significant in that it is different enough from the other um, polyomaviruses that um, it has implications in terms of um, antigenic epitopes, um, serologic reactivity that I'll talk about a little later in the, in, in the talk. So when we initially um, found this uh, one, th 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 
uh, the, the, the MCV sequences, what we did was to um, um, develop a PCR-based assay to look to see if we can identify it in other Merkel cell tumors. And so we had 10 patients who had a variety of Merkel cells excised um, from them. And when we assayed them by PCR, we found that seven of these patients, in seven of these patients, their Merkel cell tumor was positive for MCV DNA, and it was robustly so, such that when we ran out of the PCR product, we had a whopping big band um, on agarose gel uh, if they didn't grow my detection. Um, there was one case um, here where we weren't able to see any product by agarose gel, um, but once we transferred the agarose gel and followed it by a southern hybridization using probes from Merkel cell polyomavirus, we were able to detect a positive um, southern signal. So we actually amplified the PCR um, test. And then there were two cases where we were not able to detect any of the polyomavirus DNA, and we went back to these cases and used 13 primer pairs that covered the entire genome of the um, MCV to convince ourselves that indeed, um, you know, we didn't have a primer polymorphism or any other reason why we couldn't detect it by PCR. So what we came up with is that with um, Merkel cell tumors, I am sorry, don't seem to be getting this. Uh, with Merkel cell tumors, 80% of them in our hands uh, are positive for MCV. When we tested control tissues, these are like consecutive surgical biopsies from one day or skin, skin tumor controls, we found that 8 to 16% of them were positive for MCV. But this positivity was very, very low. We were not able to detect it just from straight ethidium bromide agarose um, gel. We had to uh, resort to um, southern hybridization. And so we still came up with a, uh, a pretty good odds ratio uh, of the association of uh, 43. These results have been replicated. And um, at this point, what we can say is that um, MCV is associated with approximately 70 to high 80 um, percentage of um, Merkel cell um, um, ca carcinoma in various populations from various geographic areas. So, so at this point um, in our investigation, we had, um, we had a causal, well, we didn't have a causal association. We had an association in terms of we can find the DNA more commonly in uh, Merkel cell carcinomas, but we had a subset that were entirely negative, and that was that was problematic for us and presented a conundrum. Um, we didn't know that this was a passenger virus. And so with extended studies, what we found was that actually um, we were able to see monoclonal integration of the virus in these tumors. And let me just d uh, take you through this very quickly. Uh, th one of our first tumors that we examined for the T antigen sequence, uh, we found that uh, by uh, three prime race, we were able to detect three transcripts. One was viral, and two were viral human chimeras. One ended at a polyadenylation site within the T antigen, but the other two read through into a site on chromosome three at the PTPRG uh, suspected tumor suppressor locus. And so this showed that uh, we had viral integration because we went back to the DNA, and indeed we found that exact same pattern in the DNA. And this patient also had a metastasis, and when we tested the metastasis, we, we got the same pattern of, uh, of integration of transcript expression as well as uh, integration. And so at least in this case, there was monoclonal metastatic ex expansion. This said to us that the virus was there at the beginning or the inception of carcinogenesis. Um, so even though we didn't know uh, the integration site in other tumors, we hypothesized that they were all integrated, and we um, made a one enzyme cutter uh, southern integration assay where we knew the sequence of the genome. We were able to uh, cut the genome uh, once, with a one cutter, and what we would expect is that if 
if the tumor was integrated, the southern band that we would see when probed with viral genome would give us higher or lower bands than the unit uh, size of the genome. And indeed, that's what we saw in the majority. Um, in these lanes that are negative for uh, hybridization signals, these were the tumors that were negative by PCR or plus minus by PCR. But in almost all of them, we had bands above 5.3. In the ones that had a really uh, uh, prominent band um, at about the unit size, we believe that there is still integration there and that we have head to tail concatenation with viral genome, but we have yet to prove that. So since these tumors are really rare and we want to work with these in uh, a biologically in vitro s type system, um, we looked very hard for um, Merkel cell lines. And in the literature, it has been published um, uh, many cell lines that are, have, have been derived from Merkel cell carcinomas. And when we tested it with our assay, we found two cell lines from Steve Rosen um, at Northwestern now. Um, that were positive, but none of the other cell lines um, that we tested, um, for example, the UISO cell line, MCC26 cell line, none of them were positive for MCV. And when we looked at the growth phenotype, the negative ones always tended to grow in an inherent fashion, whereas the um, MKL1 cell line, uh, the MCV positive cell lines tend to grow in um, a suspension. And here's the southern showing the monoclonality of, of MKL1. So having this in hand, um, as we were looking at the T antigen and sequencing through the T antigen of, of multiple Merkel cell carcinomas, um, we found something sort of disconcerting at first. Um, we found that there were a lot of mutations, and these circles represent the sites of mutations along the T antigen. Um, the uh, the open circles are synonymous nucle nucleotide polymorphisms. The pink circles are non-synonymous. And um, the black circles represent changes or mutations in the T antigens that we se sequence that caused a premature termination of the T antigen. Now, you know, if, if you were a tumor virologist and T antigen was the end-all, be-all, and that was the tumor oncogene, um, sort of, you really don't want to say that, that that protein is mutated, but that's actually what we found because when we compared um, sequences from other tissues that did not have a high level, that were not from um, carcinomas, uh, we were able to PCR up the, TD, t uh, the T antigen um, sequence, and they were all encoding a complete open reading frame. So what this would... Um, you know, we looked and we looked, and um, when we put it in the context of the diagram, what we saw was that all of the premature termination signals that are indicated by these um, arrows in these particular tumors occurred such that all of them deleted the helicase domain. The majority of them also deleted the origin binding domain, but all of them retained the tumor suppressor binding domain, the LXCXC domain, and um, all the N-terminal functions. So. Um, that would predict to us that um, functionally uh, the T antigen retained tumor suppressor activity and yet ablated its, um, well, that sort of, that the, the ability to replicate had been ab ablated, not through any contrivance of the T antigen. And so to test this hypothesis, what we did was to take a T antigen that was from wild type full length and T antigens from one of the tumors that was prematurely truncated, made constructs with a V5 tag, overexpressed it with RB that's HA tagged, and we found that there was a specific, antigen, um, specific interaction between the RB as and the T antigen of MCV, and that this was specific uh, for the LXCXE binding domain because when we used a mutant that um, um, uh, changed uh, an am amino acid, we lost the binding. And this has been done many times. This is our positive control with SV40, where SV40 wild type with the LXCXE binds RB and the mutant with uh, the LXCXK does not. So going on, uh, we did an origin replication assay to see if indeed this function 
um, as predicted by, by, by the changes that we saw in sequencing, uh, was ablated. And so we took, um, this, is a, this is a mini uh, origin replication assay where we only take a segment of the MCV origin, put it in a plasmid, transfect it with uh, T antigen. And we use T antigen that was wild type as well as tumor-derived T antigens. And it, not only in 293, but also in UISO cells, it's only the wild-type T antigen with full-length, untruncated open reading frame do we detect um, replication in the mammalian cells. And so um, this is our positive control with SV40. And what we find interesting is that despite conserved binding sequences, that uh, SV40 large T and MCV large T does not um, uh, work on each other's replication origins to uh, affect um, DNA unwinding and replication. So then we wanted to see what actually would happen if um, we took one of these MCV infected tumor cell lines and put in wild type T antigen. Well, um, what we saw was that when we put in extra um, wild type T antigen, again, we saw the replication, but with uh, tumor T antigens, there was no replication. So this is the, um, the, the normal or the native origin, and there is uh, replicative activity when we overexpress wild type T antigen. And this leads us to a model for uh, the evolution of MCV in Merkel cell carcinoma, where um, an, a, a regular infection with MCV results in episomal uh, virus in the cell. However, a uh, tumor begins when um, the virus not only integrates, but integrates, and there are con concomitant mutations in the T antigen that would uh, ablate the replicative uh, uh, capacity. And you can see that there would be a lot of selection pressure for um, the, the virus to, re uh, to have these, uh, these mutations. Um, due to problems with um, origin replication and activation of DNA break response causing onion, on, onion skinning lesions at this site. So uh, one of the problems with um, polyomaviruses and human tumors that have been in the literature is that um, all of the data is based on PCR evidence and it's, it's very, it, it's, I don't think that it's been shown convincingly that there is um, an mRNA or a protein that is expressed in these cases where one, you know, reports a, a, an association between one of the polyomaviruses and uh, human cancers. And so very early on, uh, we felt that it was important to um, develop a monoclonal antibody or an antibody that's specific to MCV. And so um, we picked an epitope right here, uh, CM2B4, and uh, developed an antibody that would detect all tumor as well as wild type T antigens except for the small t because it terminates prior to this epitope site. And this antibody happily was uh, quite specific. Uh, this is a construct of MCV T antigen tagged to EGFP. When we transfect it into cells, we see the expression of EGFP co-localizing with the T antigen because this is a fused protein. When we merge it, we see that co-localization. And here is the um, control without the T antigen. And the CM2B4 antibody recognizes a protein that um, is, um, is, is, is uh, specific to our construct. Um, and when you, we compare the epitope site to the other polyomavirus, I uh, mentioned this briefly earlier on, that there was a lot of problem with cross-reactivity between the other polyomaviruses. And so um, this epitope um, is not conserved at all amongst the other polyomaviruses. And so we see that CM2B4, this antibody, is not cross-reactive um, and is actually quite specific and is really surprisingly very clean. So using this antibody, when we transfect and overexpress JCT antigen and BKT antigen and MCVT antigen, we can only pick up MCVT antigen with this antibody. 
PAB416 was originally developed to the T antigen of SV40, yet it cross-reacts with JCT antigen and BKT antigen because of the sequence similarity. And in fact, we screened about 21 um, T antigen antibodies, and all of them cross-react with um, JC and BK, but none of them picked up MCV at all. And um, here we show that uh, PAB does not pick up MCV T antigen. And here's the Western blotting with PAB416 picks up all the other human as well as SV40 T antigens, but not MCV and CM2B4 picking up only MCV T antigen. So taking this um, to um, clinical samples, well, this is actually uh, the MCC cell lines. This is a uh, MCV positive cell line, and we see really robust and strong expression of the T antigen protein in the tumor cells in the cell line. And the cell line, um, as I mentioned before, CK20 positive. Here is a MCV negative cell line that was supposed to be derived from Merkel cell uh, carcinoma, but in fact, it is probably not Merkel cell carcinoma at all because it's not CK20 positive. And then this is um, a, a biopsy using the antibody. Um, and I think that it's very pretty, but I think it dramatically shows that there is um, strong and robust expression of the MCVT antigen in the tumor cells. So here we have an H and E. Here's the tumor cells, a monomorphous small round blue cell tumor. This actually is an epithelial cluster of cells that are in the hair shaft. So the hair shaft, the follicle as it goes down, is encased in an epithelial layer as well, and that is not tumor cell, has a lot of cytoplasm, pink cytoplasm. With CM2B4, it's only the tumor cells that are positive, not other cells, and that exactly co-localizes with CK20, which indicates that that's, uh, that's the tumor. Um, and finally, what I'd like to do is um, end with, um, with the work that we did in the seroepidemiology um, that tells us a little bit about the biology of the virus. So in collaboration with Chris Buck at uh, the NIH, uh, we constructed uh, or we made constructs of um, the viral, uh, the VP1 and VP2. We expressed these uh, constructs, overexpressed them in 293 TT cells. After 48 hours, we were able to um, um, take um, the, uh, the, the, the lysates through an opti optiprep gradient, and we see that we have self-assembly of these virus-like particles um, in, in the fractions that uh, we were able to concentrate. And so using these uh, VLPs, uh, we applied them onto an ELISA plate format. And what we found was that there was, um, we tested several groups. We tested MCV positive MCC patients, sera from these individuals, as well as MCV negative MCC patients, blood donors uh, from New York, uh, commercial blood donors from Arizona, and um, SLE blood, um, uh, donors. Uh, and we used this test control group because we found that in ELISA format that patients with SLE, their sera frequently cross-reacted uh, with uh, inf uh, infectious agent ELISAs. And what we found was that there was a really high um, OD reading. Uh, th the median was uh, quite high in MCV positive patients as compared to uh, MCV negative MCC patients, blood donors, commercial donors, and SLE patients. So they had a tremendously high OD value. Uh, what this means at this point, we don't know. And uh, this, this uh, assay, we showed that this assay was um, quite specific in that we took the EC50 dilution of these patients and we took four patients that had um, MCV positive um, MCC and eight MCV positive, serologically positive blood donors. We took the EC50 uh, dilution of their sera and incubated the diluted sera with um, uh, VLPs from both uh, BK and MCV. And what we have is that uh, the sera that was incubated with MCV VLPs um, uh, was competed out, whereas with BK VLP, there was no um, competition at all uh, in any of them. So this assay is highly specific for MCV, and although we didn't test JC or WU or KI, um, we showed that at least for BK, there is no cross-reactivity with the study. Uh, with the study.
And then um, to determine the age-specific seroprevalence of MCV, um, we uh, examined uh, cross-sectional distribution of 150 patient sera. And what we found was that in individuals who uh, were 15 years of age or younger, um, we saw approximately 50% uh, seroprevalence. And this is compared to individuals who were older than 50, where we found a seroprevalence of about 80%. And our conclusion from this study is that um, this is actually a very common um, infection, and there's an age-associated um, increase um, in uh, exposure to this agent. Um, so this is a very common um, um, viral infection in the human population, and yet because we think because of the integration event and the, the, the required mutation that has to occur, that these tumors are very rare and develop very rarely. And so to pull this talk together, um, what we found was that the MCV DNA is detected more commonly in Merkel cell carcinoma than in control tissues but that there really is a distinct subgroup of Merkel cell carcinoma that is not causally associated to this virus, is not associated with this virus, and this is reproduced um, in many, many labs. Um, the Merkel cell genome is monoclonally integrated in Merkel cell tumors where we can find it in high abundance. Um, and because of the mutations that we see, these signature mutations in the MCVT antigen, um, MCV cannot be a passenger virus because it's replication defective. Um, and uh, we show that there's robust um, protein expression in tumors that is are associated with the infection and that MCC may be a common infection in humans. And finally, um, I'd like to um, recognize and acknowledge the individuals who uh, did all the work that I've showed. Um, the, this is Pat Moore. He is the co-director of our lab, and he, he's also my spouse, so we have a very um, personal and as well as professional <laughs> collaboration here. Um, the work, uh, the DTS work was done by Hui Chen Feng. Um, the biology, the functional biology were done by these two postdocs, um, Massachusetts and Hin Jin. Uh, the PCR antibody work was uh, performed by Reedy, a graduate student, and the serologic assay was done by Yanis Tostoff. And as I mentioned, Chris Buck at the Lab for Cellular Oncology at the, um, at the NIH, um, we worked closely with them to develop the serologic assay. Um, Steve Rosen provided the MCV positive cell lines, and um, Ole Europe is our resident um, SV40 large T expert he trained in the, ra uh, in the labs of Brian Schaafhausen and Tom Roberts and uh, is a new junior faculty in the molecular virology program at Pittsburgh. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions? So, Yuan, it seems a bit of a paradox to me that um, the single event that ought to be able to uh, allow for integration and nullify the C-terminus would be an integration event right in the distal part of T antigen. But I got the impression you didn't see that in your collection, that everything integrated in a way that had an undisturbed T antigen ORF and then acquired a subsequent stop codon. Do you have any insight into that? No. I, I don't know why. Um, so we've really only mapped one side of integration in terms of exactly where and what genes are in proximity to that integration site. We do know from the monoclonal integration pattern that it's not at the same site in each tumor. We also don't know where in the virus genome that our integration site occurs, so we don't know that there is a similar E2, you know, site. Um, we know that in one of the tumor, the T antigen tumors that we sequence, it looks like there is an integration site in the T antigen, in the C terminus, but that is only one case out of eight tumors that we tested. And so right now, there's not a consistent pattern. We don't know if the genome integration site um, all belong to a single pathway. It, that's still to be determined, but we don't. Do you know if um, these vi the T antigen engages the p53 protein, or if uh, if the 
p53 pro gene is uh, mutated or wild type in the cancers so in the literature historically people have examined p53 and various other um, you know oncogenes or tumor suppressors and there are very few cases where there's mutations in the genome so what we see is we believe that there is an interaction with full length um, we see that there is we, we know that MCVT antigen has a, an effect on P53. We have very, very low levels of P53 when we put in the viral T antigen. And so it makes it very hard to say adamantly that there's an interaction because when we do IPs under those conditions, there's very little P53 to IP down. But I think that there is. But there's definitely an effect on P53. I was wondering if you have any evidence of um, mechanism of spread or if there's a non-human reservoir of the virus? Mm. I can speculate. I think it's a lymphotropic virus. Um, we detect it in so many tissues, and one would have to say that it's, you know, it infects all tissues, or that what is in common with all of these tissues is that we have, you know, blood going through all of these tissues. Um, the mode of spread, um, WU and KI appears to be spread by respiratory mechanisms. Um, there is a group that has published uh, recently that says that they that they detect MCV and respiratory secretion. So that could be a po possible route of transmission. But uh, clearly, since children um, are exposed to it very very early and it increases <coughs> with age, it's it's clearly a, a casual exposure type of situation. Is, is there anything known about the Merkel cell prior to infection that would predispose it plus this virus to give rise eventually to a tumor? And why the Merkel cell? No, we don't know if it's a receptor issue or, as Arnie mentioned last night, it may be a, 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 a tissue-specific expression issue. We don't know at this point. Has, have you looked at papillomas with choroid plexus and mesotheliomas? Because mm -hmm. it's floating around the literature mm -hmm. is a lot of implications yes. which are very poorly substantiated, yeah. I think, but yeah. about SB40 virus, and um, it, I mean, there must, might be some chance that this virus was being mistaken by a PCR reaction right, 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 or right, something right. like that. So, so that, was, that was why we were really interested in making an antibody, because then we can screen tissue microarrays and look at all of these um, diseases that are associated, have been associated, and we find no expression and no evidence of DNA or protein in choroplexes, mesotheliomas, um, what are the other things that are so to SV40, yeah, yeah. ependymomas. Um, I think yeah. it's very important that you find it expressed and integrated in the cells because in those cases, they do not. They, they just find a PCR product. Right, um, right, 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 right. Which is right. not very good evidence Right, itself. right. It's it's hard to it's hard to make a causal association with just PCR evidence. So, uh, uh, given the the sort of interesting quandary that this brings up, I think, why don't adenoviruses cause tumors in humans? And <laughs> why, you know, why didn't SV40 cause tumors in humans? And <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> you stumped me. I have no idea. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are we gonna.